Good morning. Um, I guess we should get started because we have a lot to talk about. Uh, my name is Lewis Burke. I, uh, am a, I have a small boutique litigation firm in New York. Uh, for, for, I started out at the Securities and Exchange Commission cutting my teeth on investigations, and I wound up uh, on the defense side for a number of years, and ultimately uh, my business evolved into doing class actions about 15 years ago. So that is a unique animal in the United States for those of you who are outside of the United States and don't have the benefit or, uh, I'm not sure, maybe it's the curse of class actions. Uh, but in the, in the United States, we have a number of class actions in all phases of litigation. Uh, I specialize in a very narrow area uh, in the financial instrument area, futures, uh, some securities, mostly derivative cases. Uh, for example, uh, you may have read a little bit about LIBOR, uh, foreign currency benchmark, treasury securities, or treasury benchmarks, SSA bonds, gold, silver, those are the kind of cases that I join into. Uh, they're very large cases, and uh, no one law firm is usually running them. They have teams really armies of lawyers uh, that are helping prepare, investigate, do document review, uh, and they involve millions of documents with very sophisticated systems. Uh, so that's generally my practice. Um, so one of the cases that we are, Tom and I are working on is uh, the topic of this discussion today, and uh, my gosh, every day it's like a thrill a minute there's something in the paper uh, that somebody is writing, and frankly, today, I'm not sure what to believe because it is, um, it changes. Um, I don't know how much you have followed 1MDB, uh, but it's a complex uh, scandal, and it's about the Prime Minister of Malaysia. Um, I, I've traveled to Malaysia and I've met with some of the people that uh, take issue with what has happened with the money uh, in this sovereign fund. And uh, well, they certainly have a right to have a complaint about it. Um, where the money has wound up, according to some of the sources that we've looked at uh, through the Department of Justice complaint in the United States, which Tom is going to talk about. Uh, today uh, is remarkable because that complaint is the most detailed complaint about tracing money and tracing the players uh, that I've ever seen, you know, doing this for a long time. Um, <clears throat> so what we're, what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about the background uh, for, for anybody that is not totally familiar with what uh, one MDB is and how it worked. So question, what is, what is MDB? And uh, as, we, as we say on this, on this first slide, it is a, uh, I never can remember all the words in place, so I'm gonna read them. Uh, the Malaysia Development Berhad Sovereign Wealth Fund of Malaysia uh, was a fund, and it was created through another fund that existed uh, in 2008. Uh, that was established by uh, the Prime Minister, and the Prime Minister of Malaysia became the head of that fund. He's the chief financial officer. If you envision a fund that I know a number of you are, are familiar with, you have the chief financial officer of the fund. He is automatically, as the Prime Minister, the chief officer of 1MDB. Uh, so when they created MDB, as we've stated in, in 2009, he became the person in charge and put people in charge of the fund to run the fund, a board of directors, people that he was familiar with and knew. Uh, and that's how the fund got started. So they had a little bit of money in it, but nothing like they raised, uh, as we'll talk about. So what was the purpose of the fund? <clears throat> it's, uh, 
it's pretty, a sovereign fund is a, a particular animal that is, there, there are guidelines on regulating a sovereign fund worldwide. They're called Santiago uh, principles and uh, that evolves from a lot of discussions, meetings, and, and how, do we, how do we run these funds. This fund was to be for the benefit of the Malaysian people, to buy power plants, to, to create an infrastructure. Uh, there was a, a huge parcel of, parcel of land in the middle of uh, Kuala Lumpur that the fund contracted to purchase and then kind of did nothing with it for years. And it still sits in the middle of Malaysia as a primary piece of real estate that the fund purchased uh, to develop. So that's what it was created to do. Um, well, we've all read about what happened with some of the money. Uh, and as we'll, we'll show you in these slides, um, <clears throat> what, what, they, what they did is they created a maze of companies where they were able to siphon off funds that were raised by uh, some of the uh, bond offerings that were, what were done by Goldman Sachs. But let me just tell you about who these players are uh, before we get into that. I think, yeah, let's go back one. Um, <clears throat> so the first, the first person is, of course, Najib Razak, who is the Prime Minister of Malaysia. And you probably have read a little bit about him if you follow uh, any of the articles that have come out on, on this fund. Um, his wife, uh, who uh, I think I've, what I've read in the press is that she does a good job at spending his money, and a lot of it. Uh, you could smell the, the burning of the plastic throughout Malaysia as a, you know, that's, that's what people have commented about. She just is really, uh, she, I'm not sure that there are many women around that could beat her on spending money. Uh, Riza Aziz, sorry for the spelling here, but he is the stepson of the Prime Minister. And uh, he is involved in uh, a number of entities that have wound up with some of the money from the fund. Uh, he was actually uh, a partner in creating the film the, the, the Wolf of Wall Street uh, through a uh, company that they created called Red Granite Productions. So that's the sexy part of what they did. They had big parties in Cannes and they had a movie with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio and uh, they had in, incredible flair in, in the south of France with you know huge yachts and uh, wonderful parties and $25,000 a bottle champagne that they actually used some of the money from 1MB and DB for. Um, Jolo is, um, is, I guess, he is written about as the main architect of the companies that have uh, been used to move the money. Uh, and when I say move the money, the money has moved all over the world. Uh, in the recent, just a side commentary, uh, in the recent uh, Department of Justice case, uh, as you know, Tom will talk about there, he created an entity in New Zealand and he had trustees that would not file a claim. So he had to get rid of the trustees and any more about that in a minute. And then we have, uh, you know, you always have to include the investment bank when we look at these kind of cases. Uh, I guess it's just our general approach to trying to analyze what happened here. Well, where did they get the money? Tim Lesner was the executive at Goldman Sachs who was stationed in Southeast Asia and uh, worked with uh, the prime minister in raising mon money for the fund. They, they had some bond offerings that were um, done over a period of years, I'd say probably three to four years. The main raises were done in uh, 2012 and thir 
13. So let's just talk a little bit about uh, one of the ra we'll, we'll talk about two raises, this, this first one, and how the, the funds <coughs> went uh, from one MBD. I, I don't know if you can see this slide or read what's on the slide, <coughs> but we've tried to just give you an example, two examples of what happened with the money from the fund. Um, in January of 2012, uh, the fund engaged Goldman to do a bond offering that was guaranteed, the, here's the important part of it, it was guaranteed by 1MDB and IPIC, which is the International Petroleum Corporation of Saudi Arabia. And um, then in May of 2012, Goldman arranges the under, and underwrites about 1.75 billion U.S. dollars uh, in a project called Magnolia Bond Offering. And what's interesting to see is that they earned about $200 million in commissions from that uh, $2 billion offering. Now, under the Santiago principles, uh, the general commission for raising money for a, a sovereign fund, not necessarily a corporation, is about 1% to 2%. So this is 10%. Uh, kind of a high commission, you know, should have been questioned, I guess. It was questioned, I mean, as I've read, uh, and they did it anyway. So in May of 2012, uh, they um, took $907 million in the proceeds from the bond sale and transferred that from an account at Bank of New York Mellon to Falcon Bank, uh, in Switzerland. <clears throat> right. And um, Falcon Bank has been uh, actually investigated and is no longer in existence as a result of this transaction as well as others. That is the transfer of funds that were transferred under substantial question uh, along with another uh, bank, <coughs> an old bank in uh, Lugano. Then l l just the next day, uh, about $577 million in bond proceeds was wired from Falcon Bank to ABAR BVI, an account at BSI Bank in the Bahamas. Uh, I'm sorry, BVI, British Virgin Islands. Um, so they were just moving this money in a, in a pretty elaborate, I would say, laundering scheme for no other better way, just to move the money from one account to another, to ultimately, uh, the funds were diverted through ABAR, and I'll explain what ABAR was in a second, and they were transferred to a company called Blackstone. That is not the Blackstone that you would, or I think you would think about in New York. Uh, it was a namesake of Blackstone that was created by uh, Joe Lowe in order to move the money uh, into this account. So. This, the second example of the funds that were raised, I get that. Yeah, the second amount was uh, $3.5 billion, uh, and that was in a similar way. Uh, if, you, if you want copies of these slides, we can certainly email them to you. These, these are both the $3 billion, these are two transactions. Right. Yeah, okay. Right. They're two separate transactions. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, but I don't think you should go. Through. You don't have to go through it okay. again. Okay. Well, this is 2012. This is 2013. Right. The second uh, transaction for three billion was a year later in t in 2013, uh, and in a very similar way, they diverted the funds uh, at the end of the day through a number of transactions through these banks. Uh, and companies that were owned and either owned or controlled by Jolo, the, the financial architect, uh, into uh, accounts that he controlled. Uh, again, if people want to get copies of these diagrams, we can certainly uh, get them for you. I just wanted to throw out, if anybody has any questions or comments they wanted to raise, please just raise your hand. We're, we're happy to to talk about it, it might uh, might be in interesting, yeah. So as you mentioned under the Santiago Accords, it 
it's clearly pretty shifty to have the 10% commission on the sovereign wealth bond, bond issue. Was there any internal dissent within Goldman Sachs regarding this bond offering? Can, and can I have that? Yeah, go ahead. Well, uh, not that we don't know all the details yet because it's still unfolding, but you're right. Um, there certainly would be a lot of people involved, and I think when we get to the point of, of accomplishing some discovery inside Goldman Sachs, and no one has yet, including the government, we'll find that. Uh, it's, it's early right now in the case, so we don't know. Um, you know, this is five times the normal amount of commission, right? So the question is, are they just overcharging, or are they also perhaps getting, or are they perhaps, perhaps, getting some kind of kickback or bribe at Goldman to keep quiet about the transfers of money. Now, Goldman, when they underwrite a bond deal, if they underwrite a bond deal for, for $5, there's still a process they have to go through, let alone $100 million, let alone a billion, let alone the $3.5 billion. So um, they, they've hung out Tim Leisner, the fellow who we mentioned, uh, Lewis mentioned earlier, as the guy who's in charge, and they've, and they've put him on leave, and sort of held him out as a scapegoat. But you will find, we will find, I guarantee, based on having done this for 30 years, we will find that there were hundreds of Goldman Sachs people involved in this process, okay? And a number of committees involved in this process uh, on different levels. First of all, just to, to do an issuance, like I said earlier, of a billion or even less, a billion, it goes through various committees at Goldman Sachs, okay, and approval committees, from commitment committees to others. Something of this magnitude would definitely be on the radar, there's no question, it's on the radar of London office and the New York office, okay? So I'm not, and I'm, I'm just telling you this based on, I guarantee you I'm right, okay? That the, 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 the information hasn't come out yet, but having done this, this is, this is how these guys operate, right? And, I, and we've done hundreds of these cases. So you will find the New York office was heavily involved, the London office was heavily involved, and I believe, Lewis, that uh, something you showed me, said this might have been, in one of those years, one of the, the largest, if not, one of the largest, if not the largest commissions that Goldman Sachs got from a bond deal, which makes sense based on what you're saying. If it's, if it's five times the normal commission, this was the largest bond commission in Goldman Sachs. Think about that, okay? So that's going to raise a whole other specter of people who are involved, because those hero sheets go out, you know, that everyone gets, that the congratulatory sheets go out, right. the parties are held uh, for all the guys, and you know the CEO of Goldman Sachs and the board knows about the top commissions coming into the company, right, the top areas of profitability. So this will all unwind in the future. You're, you're going to see this is all going to come out. Um, so I think that's the, the sort of the way to answer your question, which is yes, you will find there were dozens if not hundreds of people who were quite aware of all these transactions. And the question is, should they have been aware or were they aware, I mean not just of the offering, but the fact that the proceeds were not used, as Lewis said, to build you know, roads and, and infrastructure for the country, but were used to instead buy L'Hermitage Hotel in Beverly Hills which they use it for, right? Or for yacht parties, or to invest in, to be the investor, the number one investor in Wolf of Wall Street. It would not got financed, it would not have been on the screen had it not been for the $100 million that came from this pension fund designed to benefit the people of Malaysia, not to give J-Lo and his buddies, you know, access to Hollywood stars, right? So the, just, just a couple of other comments about the deal itself. <clears throat> so we, we analyzed the offering documents that were used to sell the deal. And the deal was done, uh, I believe, it's been a while since I looked at these, but I believe that the deal was done in London. So, by the way, doing a deal, Goldman Sachs doing a deal in London would not take it away from U.S. regulatory guidelines, Dodd-Frank and others. And it was done as a Regulation S offering. I don't know if everybody knows what a Reg S offering is, but under the securities laws in the United States, you cannot sell any of the bonds to a U.S.-based entity or individual. They, they have to be sold offshore. So this is totally an offshore offering. 
And many U.S. companies offer Reg S offerings. They sell their deals offshore, but they cannot, the, the securities that are sold cannot come to rest in the United States for a period of time. Um, it's based on what I have been told, that was not done. There were some U.S.-based entities that kind of bought into this. So, look, you're Goldman Sachs and you have your, your people, your insurance companies, your institutions, and all the people that have a lot of money, and they say, well, they ask Goldman, well, what have you got coming out? And Goldman has a 10% deal. Uh, and they say, well, you know, can we get a piece of it? Of course you can get a piece of it. So that's why they got it, a 10% deal, my gosh. So part of that deal was guaranteed, the, 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 the Goldman deal is guaranteed by the Saudi IPIC, the petroleum company. It's a Saudi petroleum company, but the question is, was it really the Saudi petroleum company? Or, or was it another entity that was set up by Jolo? Good question. And there's lots of uh, articles that I've read that indicate that it's a sham company that provided a guarantee. The, the, you know, the, so there's, there's an element of what Goldman did is they sold the deal in a reg S offering. It says right in the papers you can't be a U.S. based entity or individual to buy this, yet the list includes, again, I can't vouch for this, but I've heard and read that those entities are U.S.-based, some are U.S.-based entities. Uh, and the second part, or the second comment I wanted to make, is that normally if you did, you'd think anyway, that if you did a sovereign fund offering, this is for a country, it's billions of dollars, that the money would be transferred to, let's say, the Bank of Malaysia, or a huge bank that would hold billions of dollars of this sovereign fund. No. It was sent to a bank in Lugano. A little bank in Lugano. So that kind of raises a red flag. Why would Goldman send the money to Lugano? I mean, they know about Lugano. I mean, everybody knows about Lugano. It's a great, great place to visit. Beautiful lakeside views. But a lot of people that have banks and generally, that would be a question. We call it a red flag. The government certainly calls it a red flag. And under Dodd-Frank, you're supposed to investigate that. So that would be the comment that I have about the way the money was handled is certainly questionable. And, and BSI, the bank that Lewis refers to, uh, the bank that Lewis refers to is BSI Bank in Lugano. And it was one of the oldest most sort of tradition steeped banks in Swiss history, been around for literally hundreds of years. And this tax transaction was ended up being such a big part of its business that when the government of Switzerland came in and seized, um, uh, seized assets and started questioning, the bank folded, which was a shame, but maybe, maybe it was deserved. Kind of reminded me of Barings Bank, if some of you remember the, the thing from 15, 20 years ago in Hong Kong, that was the oldest, you know, sort of bank and stately English bank that got caught up in a trading uh, scam and, and that sort of folded the whole, just folded the whole bank just like that overnight. But Lewis is right. I mean, that's one of the many red flags is why in the world they transfer for this tiny little bank in Lugano, which is a vacation town. It's not, it's not a financial center like Zurich or, or even Geneva is a secondary one. Um, can I say a few things about the assets? Please. Okay. Yeah, please. Um, so, so you have, I mean, in, es in essence, to summarize what Lewis has gone through so far, what you have is, a fund that went and raised six to eight billion dollars, supposed to be used for infrastructure. Now we find off that billions, at least three billion, at least that we know of so far, three billion is siphoned off from the, you know the people of the, the country of Malaysia to be used for you know sort of a party lifestyle, movies, you know, uh, uh, hotels, jets, apartments in New York. Okay, so enough though, enough was siphoned off into the United States and used to buy assets here. The United States, one of the money laundering capitals of the world, was, was brought over to the United States. There was over a billion dollars 
in assets purchased in this country, a billion dollars, can you imagine, um, from this fund alone. So the United States government, though, thankfully, uh, uh, starts to focus and hone in on it, and then back in July, does the largest asset seizure in United States history. Think about it. The largest asset seizure in U.S. history. And they, the, 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 the Justice Department and the Seizure Department got coordinated across the country from New York to L.A. and everywhere in between, and within about a week to ten days seized over a billion dollars, a billion dollars of assets, including things like you know, apartment in Time Warner Center, if you're familiar with New York City, it's one of the most expensive buildings, uh, other apartments and townhouses there that this fellow J-Lo and others used for their friends, the Lermitage Hotel in Beverly Hills, a very nice hotel, if any of you know that one, um, yachts, um, um, artwork, hundreds of millions of dollars of artwork that was purchased too, the, the gov our government thankfully uh, seized, which was very positive. Um, the United States government now has seized and has rights to, subject to of course how the court proceedings are going to play out, to all the revenues from the Wolf of Wall Street movie. Very, very successful movie. So the people of Indonesia, you know, hopefully we'll get something from that. We'll see. Um, but that, that was um, so large that it, it required literally hundreds of agents, including FBI agents um, in the corruption unit, the Justice Department's uh, kleptocracy, kleptocracy unit, which if, if you guys heard um, the general presentation yesterday, but there was some talk about the kleptocracy unit. The kleptocracy unit was involved in this, which was uh, good to see. Um, they then, um, uh, um, the Justice Department then ran into a little bit of problems with the State Department, because you can imagine when you're going in now, and now you're seizing a billion dollars of assets, and, you're, and we're, we're claiming that this is all fraudulently siphoned off. You've got, as Lewis said, the Prime Minister, who's your Chief Financial Officer of the country of Malaysia, think about that, and his stepson, who's involved, and his stepson's running buddy, this guy Jolo, involved. So the political implications are huge too. And this has been a, a, a mass problem or, or issue, I should say, in Malaysia, as you might imagine. This is the prime minister sort of fighting this corruption issue daily. And um, it also implicates then, of course, U.S. Chinese, U.S. Chinese Malaysia relationships too. Okay, so now, because we're, we're coming in as a country, seizing a billion dollars of assets, saying they're siphoned off by the Prime Minister, by the Prime Minister's son, his running buddy. Um, and Malaysia's been a great ally to us in sort of shoring up our, our relations with China, okay? But this has obviously caused a huge rift. I don't know how one resolves it. I mean, the reality is money was, it appears that money was definitely stolen and, and some of it was put in this country. Um, but sort of how do you, how do you handle those, those issues is a, another one. Um, the kleptocracy unit, I think you know, was set up in 2010. Um, its biggest attempt at a seizure before this was about $800 million um, against some um, Uzbekistan uh, telecom companies. And they actually were successful in getting a settlement in that particular case. Um, of course, the issues of money laundering and, um, and siphoning of funds away are, are you know, central to this whole thing. And, um, you know, like I said before, uh, once again, it's real estate. Sort of something that we talked about yesterday, too. A lot of real estate, and not, not, not just the art and the movies, but there's a tremendous amount of real estate. So you've got to wonder, um, this is just one country, this is just one scam. Uh, how much money in this country has, is, has been used to sort of fuel the real estate boom that comes from, you know, illicit sources? Just along the lines of what Tom is talking about, um, one of the... I think I was in a program yesterday that talked a little bit about how uh, money is moved into the United States and there was, a, there was a program on 60 Minutes. I don't know if everybody's familiar with 60 Minutes, but it's a, it's a, it's a great source of information uh, for people, for bizarre incidents, and this is one of them uh, that I'm going to tell you about, and that is how foreign entities are able to come to the United States and visit with law firms and suggest a questionable transaction and the law firms will, in, in this particular case, they interviewed one man who was a former president of the American Bar Association 
Uh, and he basically thought about the deal so much so that on television, these people did not know that they were being filmed, uh, but he thought about it uh, and ultimately declined to take the case. But there were lawyers that said, yeah, we can help you. We can move the money into our escrow accounts and we can use the money to buy whatever you want. We don't have to look into anything. Well, in this case, one of the law firms in the United States, known as Sherman and Sterling, ran about a billion dollars through their escrow account and facilitated the purchase of all this real estate. It's bizarre. I don't think they asked a question. I don't know. But I do know from the Justice Department complaint, that is a fact of life. Their escrow account was used in order to move the money through to purchase the real estate. I'm not suggesting whether it's good, bad, legal, or illegal, but nobody really questioned it. They just did it. So that was one of it. Let's, the, the sexy part of this case, of course, is you know, going to the movies and The Wolf of Wall Street, which is, um, I, I have to say, I, I met a year ago uh, with some people that are doing uh, a documentary of this case. It, it'll be about this case, and they've interviewed a lot of people, but they, uh, I met with them and talked to them about what they were doing as part of what, what I was doing. And um, it was fascinating how they were running around at, in, in the south of France and filming uh, during the Cannes Film Festival. Uh, and what they told me was fascinating. I, I'm not sure whether that was confidential or not, but it's part of what is in this chart. So just summarizing this chart, um, Jolo, the architect, and the stepson, Aziz, well, Aziz became good friends and a partner with a guy named Joey McFarland who was in the movie business. And he was looking for money along with uh, DiCaprio to make this movie. So this was sort of like, well, what do we do with this money that we just stole? Let's make a movie. And why not? Isn't that what everybody does? They make a movie, buy a yacht, buy a plane, get a bunch of, you know, fancy people to have a party. So that's what they did. So Aziz and J-Lo took $155 million from the from the fund that they had moved through different shell corporations and funded the Wolf of Wall Street. So this little maze shows you how the money ultimately wound up in Red Granite Productions, which is the producer of the Wolf of Wall Street, where it came from, how 1MDB moved money to ABAR Investments, which was a BVI company, then part of the money was divided up and went to two holding companies. One was Red Granite Capital, and the other was Tolina Holdings, which was another BVI company. And then that money wound up, 155 million wound up in Red Granite, and that's where they got the money to make The Wolf of Wall Street, which is about a scam itself. I'm sorry? Do you know what the reason is for this structure? Why didn't you just move back straight from Alba to uh, Red Granite? We've got to ask J-Lo. Joe Lowe. Um, you, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure everyone out here has seen different, uh, I guess, structures is the best way to do it. You know, when we used to do funds, we, we had uh, we had a hub and spoke structures that are still used today because that's how you did it. You didn't you wanted you needed an offshore portion of the structure so that it would not fall uh, into either Commodity Futures Trading Commission or SEC regulatory view. So only the onshore and you only use the the advisors were onshore in the United States, but everything else was offshore in an offshore fund. But it wasn't, it, the, the advisors don't make you subject, just because they're advising an offshore fund on what to buy and what to sell, doesn't make the fund itself subject to regulation, which is what they're trying to avoid because it's too expensive 
they're not trying to, I don't think they're trying to create secrecy, at least in the funds that I did. What they were trying to do is they were trying to do it at a reasonable economic uh, level. So I don't know whether they were trying to save money here. I doubt it. Again, I'd only be guessing. Right. Right. Well, um, I'm not sure that that it. He who is in power controls it. You know, the prime minister controls it. So I don't think that there's any issue about that. But you know, boy, I, I'd only be guessing to tell you about what what the reasons were behind the structure. You don't want to say, too, um, not just Sherman and Sterling, too, that was the um, target of the prosecutors, but also Sullivan and Cromwell. You know, these, these large, supposedly blue chip firms, I'm not so convinced, but um, hiding literally hundreds of millions of dollars in their trust accounts. I think this kind of ties back into the presentation yesterday morning, um, too, about you know, law firms and, and what Lewis touched on, too, and some of you saw yesterday was the law firms acting as sort of the last bastion of secrecy, I think. You know, offshore, offshore accounts are, but these law firms trust accounts, you know, and, and lawyers are able to, and I'm a lawyer, you know, so I don't, I don't take any pride in this, but it's, it's probably a, a stain on our profession that lawyers using attorney-client privilege and, you know, attorney-client relationships to hide things that, you know, might even be illegal. They're not supposed to do that. They're not supposed to participate. But hundreds of millions of dollars in Sullivan and Cromwell's uh, trust account just sitting there. And I, having been at a big firm before I created my own firm, I can tell you that th those sums are not normal. You don't hold $400 million in an attorney trust account, even at a big law firm. That just raises a, a, a tremendous number of red flags. And it also, uh, now that we have money laundering regulations in place where people are much more sensitive to the way they move money around, uh, you'd think that they would be asking more questions than just say, oh, yeah, just take it in. Don't worry about it. It's okay. Um, I suspect when you get in there and, and if the government, you know, sort of dives deeper in the law firm, I don't know if they have right away. I just think they trace the money to these funds, to these uh, attorney trust accounts, and then they froze the funds, okay? But if, if the Justice Department gets in, digs emails and deeper, I bet, I bet that we'll find there are some committees and people on committees at these firms that will question some of that and wonder what it was all about. Because there are good people in these large firms, too, as well as people who aren't so good. And um, I think the internal emails would be very interesting. <laughs> Yeah, yeah so the, the, what the law firms have said so far, what we know it's public so far, is it was supposedly being held in anticipation of real estate deals. I mean, that's the general framework that we're aware of so far, okay? So that was, this, that's going to be sort of the justification. Now, at, as justice digs deeper or, or more comes out, let's, let's see, you know, if that's a legitimate excuse, if there was some backup for that, if there's actually a piece of property. They're, 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 they're claiming, on, on the surface at least, okay? that it's like an escrow account. You know, oh, we're, there was gonna be some real estate transactions, so we were holding some money pending the real estate transaction. So that's their superficial uh, response. We'll see if it holds up. No, nothing went through. The money was just sitting there. So the, um, I guess, I'm, I'm not sitting here in judgment of whether the law firm did I don't think either one of us are. I would. Whether they did anything wrong. I do. I do. Wrong. <laughs> well, I'm not. Because um, there can be uh, reasons why you, you get uh, $150 million into your escrow account to buy a transaction. I mean, look, they bought the Park Lane Hotel in New York. Uh, they bought the Hermitage Hotel in Los Angeles. They bought some very expensive real estate. And they bought some very expensive art. They bought a Van Gogh and they bought a, a Monet. Not inexpensive pictures. So uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a legitimacy partially created for purchasing that kind of an asset, whether it's diversity, whether it's a fund, whether it's whatever. So they were doing that. So I, you get the question, okay, 
client comes into your office and says, look, I want to buy a piece of real estate called the Park Lane Hotel. Uh, how are you going to buy it? I have a company I've set up. Suppose it's a fund. Maybe it's an offshore fund. How much due diligence do you do or how much are you really required to do to satisfy your obligation that you understand your client and you understand the source of the funds because he's not going to advertise we just stole this money from a sovereign fund i mean that's just not going to happen but let's be clear though too the 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 just to clarify i mean to make sure it's clear the purchases in the United States were not, I don't think, in any way done on behalf of the people of the country of Malaysia, right? These were entities set up by the stepson of the prime minister and his buddy Jolo. Is that right? right. Yeah, so I mean, just to differentiate, so... Um, Close enough. What do you mean? Close, Be, oh, well, to the, to the CEO, to the to the chief financial officer. You mean right? Yeah, to the yeah, CEO. yeah, yeah. But but I don't think I don't I don't know that Joe Lowe and uh, uh, Aziz's stepson are going to be able to make a very good case that they were buying you know so the yachts and you know, the apartments and the hotels that this was an investment for the people of Malaysia. This is not what the fund was designed to do. The fund was, as we've said many times, designed to create infrastructure in the country of Malaysia. And they need that a lot more than they need another luxury hotel in Beverly Hills, right? Well, it certainly wasn't contemplated. I mean, this, the asset acquisition in the United States of these pricey assets was not contemplated under the purpose of the fund. Purpose of the fund was strictly to uh, build an infrastructure in Malaysia or have assets in Malaysia that would be improved. Um, so. It just is, it goes against it. Anyway, let, let's move to one other thing that's, and by the way, all of these little vignettes or stories are all kind of stories that are self-contained. You, you have to understand how, how you relate them to each other is the challenge. Uh, when you look at the Justice Department complaint, which is, there, it's not just one complaint. I think there were 17 complaints in all uh, against all the properties in a seizure way. But they go through the details of tracing all the money, which was you know, far, far more than anything that I've done. But those complaints have educated me in terms of the way the structure operated and how money was transferred from one company to another. And they dug down to find out who are the owners of those, or who were the representatives of those entities. So they were able to tie it back to Malaysia and 1MDB. Can, can I, I would say a couple things about that. When, when uh, Lewis raises the fact about the structures and the complexities of the structures, and the government did a good job, our government did a good job at sort of piercing some of the structures, they're still working on others. Um, interestingly, the structures are so complex, you know, there's the, 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 the um, the flip side of a complex structure, and I think a lot of you, since your experience, know this. The, the neat thing is, of course, you can try to hide and all that. But of course, there's all these downsides too when when you're dealing with the complexity of a structure. In this particular case, when the government went in, and our government went in and seized uh, the billion dollars of assets in July across the United States, um, of course, you have as as the the the, 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 the respondent, you have a right to challenge. JLo's group couldn't really get their act together soon enough to file answers on time, so they defaulted on everything. And, um, and it was interesting because um, apparently the complexity of the ownership took some time, and then they were getting pushed back from some of their trustees. Some of the trustees did not want to answer. They didn't want to get involved. I wasn't there, but you can imagine there's any number of reasons. Maybe they didn't want to submit to jurisdiction. Maybe they didn't believe what was doing was right. You know, some of these in trustees are independent. They might not want to be a part of this whole uh, scam here. So in any event, uh, there was all these defaults. J Lo then runs off to uh, Joe Lo, sorry, runs off to New Zealand and challenges his own trustees. And there was a case that went through the court system there where he actually was successful in removing the trustees and installing new trustees and then comes back to the United States to the Central District of California where these seizure actions are pending and uh, moves to uh, uh, lift the default judgments. And of course, that just drives the government crazy. You know, they're, they're, 
famous statement was, you know, look, you live by the complex ownership structure, you die by the complex ownership structure. And that was, was sort of the, 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 the part of their um, argument, and that, you know, there was culpable conduct on, on the part of Joe Lowe and his trustees, and they shouldn't be allowed to lift the structure. I mean, they, they're the ones who created the, I mean, lift the defaults. They were the ones who created the complex structure, let them live by it, they missed the deadline to, to respond, and so the default should stand. Um, it was interesting, though, the, the, the central district judge there, though, um, did, not, did not side with the government. Um, he, he did determine that the trustees had decided not to, had affirmatively decided not to answer the, 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 the claims, the, the seizure claims, and thus defaulted intentionally, but he didn't find that to be bad conduct. He found that just to be a decision, but not um, a, a conduct that was designed um, to, to, to act in bad faith, conduct that's not, not designed to deceive the government, it was conduct not, that was not designed to sort of slow down the seizure process or anything like that. So ultimately, he did uh, lift the um, the default judgments and allowed J -Lo to to uh, Joe Lo to go ahead and respond to all these uh, seizure actions. Well, it's J Lo's family. You know, they they had the interest in the New Zealand Trust to own the asset. Again, pretty convoluted. But what's going to be interesting is. Um, I, I, there's always a, a uh, I think, ju judges think differently in, than we do as lawyers. Uh, and we find that out in every case. We think a judge is going to make a decision on something and all of a sudden we get a decision that's just totally opposite and it's explained and we just, we just wind up walking away scratching our heads is what, where, where'd that come from? So here you would have expected that a judge listening to the government trying to do right by the people of Malaysia would have said, no, too late, default, you're done, we're taking this money. But the judge didn't do that. So what's going to happen is on the challenge of the claim, there'll be discovery. And um, there'll be more information about the structure the tracing of funds. So, you know, maybe uh, they've shot themselves in the foot. Yeah. I don't know. I just anticipate that anything can happen in court, and usually it does. And here's something that I didn't see uh, as what I didn't see. I wouldn't have predicted the judge to do this, but it's still open, and it's going to run for a while because they've got some good lawyers, high-priced lawyers that are in this case, and the government is not going to back down. They're going to continue to get some discovery, and that could be a death knell. I don't know to who, but I you think know. it will. I, I think I think it will be. I think the judge probably satisfied himself that he could accomplish two things. One is he could allow some leniency because they missed the deadline, you know, to to answer and, and lift the defaults. But number two is. Yes, but so what? Now these guys are subject, Joe Lowe and his various companies are subject to all this discovery you talk about, right? Right. So now the government has an ability to figure out a lot more about how the scheme was put together. Joe Lowe or his trustees are going to have to give depositions. I mean, it's going to be a mess, right? So right. I, I, I'm going to guess the judge probably foresaw that and wasn't too worried. And, and don't forget we have this really nasty provision in the United States uh, under the code. It's 1782. I'm sure that a lot of you are familiar with it. I've heard it in no less than five sessions that I've been to about how you get discovery as a foreign entity in the United States if any of the transactions touch the United States. And there, there's going to be a lot of discovery that may not come out well uh, for either the prime minister, his stepson, or Joe Lowe, or any of these other people. And all these other cases stand on their own. I mean, the, the Wolf of Wall Street theoretically has been attached. I'm not sure what's been attached, but there's supposedly a money flow from the Wolf of Wall Street that's going to go back into a fund that ultimately will benefit the citizens of Malaysia, something like that. Although when you think about it, who are the beneficiaries of the fund now? That's kind of the question. So let's jump to, we, we have a little bit more time before we open this up for just general questions. Go ahead. Sure. 
I, I didn't hear you. No, I'm sorry. No. A, a clawback with regard to fees for? Well, it's a good question. Um, the question was, is there a clawback to the fees being paid uh, to the actors? Like, I think the obvious one would be DiCaprio. If you want to get on the internet right now, put it in DiCaprio, Malaysia, and you'll see a lot about this, right? So that's the question, is there going to be a clawback? Uh, the, the FBI has interviewed, for what it's worth, they've interviewed um, DiCaprio and some of the other stars. I, my personal guess is, I wasn't there, my personal guess is it was probably you know, fairly superficial. I, I seriously doubt this, the actors and actresses had any intent or knew, you know, what was happening. Um, DiCaprio's already stated that if this is proven, <coughs> if his fee was proven to have come from the illicit source, you know, being the theft of the Malaysian People's um, Sovereign Wealth Fund, that he will return the fee. Um, will, will the government go after it if they didn't return it? They haven't stated either way. I think they're still trying to decide. One more question. Yeah. With the uh, unusually large commission, was that was that in the prospectus for the for the for the fund? Yeah. And is that a astronomically high commission, or is that like five times five to six times normal? Well, I, I agree with Tom. It is five to six times normal. But um, generally, this is a sovereign fund. This is not a corporate raise. That's uh, let's say I don't know what the credit rating of Malaysia would have been but all these raises are based upon risk. <clears throat> so if you're raising money, the United States, let's say, raises money in a bond offering, as they do every week, um, it's generally rated as, it's pretty, pretty high rating. So what do they get as a commission in that kind of a raise? I believe it's under 1%, at least for a US bond raise. So on a sovereign country bond raise, under Santiago principles, it's between one and 2%. I mean, if you wanted to stretch it because you were doing, you know, something special and it was going to cost a lot of money and you were transparent about that, maybe you could say 3%. That's just what I've read. So, yeah, I think it's pretty high. I guess what I'm getting at is if it's an unusually large bond offering and the commission is unusually large, did anybody question it or? Well, the, 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 this, yeah, I mean, it's a good question. The discovery into Goldman Sachs hasn't begun yet, so it remains to be seen. But as I said earlier, it was the largest commission they got in that year, the largest. So I, I've got to imagine there's going to be a lot of email traffic and meetings about this. And just, you know, not necessarily that was nefarious at the first, but just asking questions about it, right? It stands out. And, and I, I think you'll find that discussion. I think you'll have people who questioned it. And I, I think you'll see internal compliance. Once again, this discovery hasn't started yet because we're new into the case. But I think you're going to find that, yes, that people did question it. But just. As a comment, just the fact that the commission was high is not the basis of an investigation that I've read about. Yeah, there were, there were a number of questions asked about it, but I don't think that there's, there has been an investigation. I think they're more interested in knowing about this guy, Tim Leisner, and his relationship to Jolo and to the prime minister's stepson. And they've looked at some bank accounts uh, of Leisner. They're starting to look at his personal bank accounts. There were apparently monies transferred from his account into other, you know, of Malaysian people's accounts during the discourse of um, these dealings. And they're trying to determine what that's all about. Why was money going back and forth? Uh, we, I don't, we don't know the answer yet. Maybe it was legitimate. Maybe it wasn't. In uh, connection with the movie, um, it's nice of Leonardo DiCaprio to want to give the salary back, but uh, the movie was actually a very good investment. Um, I think the box office was nearly 400 million, there's digital sales, etc. So, you know, they, they more than quadrupled their money. Uh, the question I have is, is A, what happens to the bondholders? Um, and, and B, how much assets do you think they are going to seize? I mean, is there actually going to be more than was. In, uh, is that, could there be a positive outcome for the people of Malaysia as well? So I don't see it so far. I mean, I guess we don't yeah. know for sure. But so far, it looks like $3.5 billion at least was skimmed off, okay, $3.5 billion. The seizure in the United States was $1 billion, the stated amount. But you know how that, those numbers can fluctuate, right, real estate. What's, what's a hotel worth? You, know, you can ask five people and get a different price, right? I, I, I don't, I mean, my personal opinion, just having gone, I don't see how they're going to get 100 cents on the dollar recouped and back to the people. 
I hope they get close to it. They, they, you know, they might get 50 cents on the dollar, 60, 70. But I, and these types of scams, you know, so much money runs off too. And what about the, you know, the 20, literally the $25,000 bottles of champagne? You're not going to recoup that money. You know, all the money you paid to charter yachts, that's never going to come back. You can't seize that money back. But we, you, I think your question related to the $400 million that was reportedly uh, the sales from the Wolf of Wall Street and whether or not that money would be part of the seizure. And I think there is, I, while I don't remember the specific details of it, it certainly has been part of the Justice Department case, that money, seizing part of it or getting a flow of funds from Red Granite based upon the source of funds. Yeah, so. but, but don't, the $400 million is a gross number too, okay? You have production costs, you have publicity costs and all that, so a lot of that money. Yeah, yeah, sure, of course. Yeah. Right, right. Well, it was a profitable investment for someone. Let, let, let's see. I mean, if, if you know, I'm sure you know about Hollywood accounting, right? It's like infamous, right? Yeah, movies make a lot of money, but then when you look at the sort of the spreadsheet, when it comes down, suddenly they've lost money, right? Because, you know, there's so much that, that, you know, there's so much accounting gimmickry in there. So it remains to be seen whether the, this investor being Joe Lowe and his buddies, not the people of Malaysia, they were doing it on, for themselves, okay? Um, you know, this investor or red, red Granite Pictures itself actually made any money. This was their only second film, by the way, Red Granite. And they had no money. And, and, and DiCaprio and his buddies have been shopping this around, this film around for seven or eight years, couldn't find any financing. They finally found it through this. So you've been mentioning repeatedly that this money will be going back to people in Malaysia. However, it appears that this money was scanned by the head of state of Malaysia and was seized as part of the autocrat. So what measures can be taken to ensure that, are we going to wait for it to be removed from power, or are we going to be taking steps to ensure this is placed in the trust that you need to invest by outside parties? What steps are we going to take to make sure that this money just doesn't go back and is restolen? Well, let, let me. Uh... Um, this is maybe a circuitous uh, way to answer that question, so I'll already admit guilt to that. Um, <clears throat> this is all involved in a political upheaval right now. Obviously, Prime Minister is going to be running for re-election uh, towards the end of this year. And look, it may be that it doesn't matter what he did with this money or, or with the fund. Uh, we've seen people uh, run for election and get elected uh, all over the place that, you know, stole money, you know, sexually abused people. Uh, you know, it's, it, it, maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe the people of Malaysia like this guy and they like what he did when he stole all the money or he, you know, kind of orchestrated, th you know, thieving the money. I read commentaries every day about the, the scheme in place to either get rid of them or reelect them. I mean, you just don't know what they're, they're doing. And every, you don't know whether to believe what you read today uh, as a commentary to what they did. For example, uh, the next, next slide is about a settlement that was made uh, in London pursuant to an arbitration uh, where they, uh, I'll just, it, you can just read the slide and see what it says. There, part of the bond deal was that the uh, 1MDB guaranteed payments that were due this year to, to, at two different intervals, they, they reneged on the payments, they didn't make them. Now. They set, in, they set an arbitration in place, and they've s reportedly settled the arbitration by one of you saying, okay, we'll make a payment of this interest on the bond, on the first bond that was due in 17. So it's reported that they made a settlement, and the comment about the settlement is that, well, it makes, first of all, there's a comment about what it does to the Justice Department case, it says, makes that case look like it doesn't even exist. And then there's a comment about how this confirms that they stole the money. So what do you believe? You know, it's just, 
every day there's a new story and a new tact. Um, there, there's, it goes f so far afield to get involved in a religious analysis uh, in the Muslim world as to how to approach this whole problem and how that's a vote-getting analysis. The only definiteness we're going to have is, is as more clarity comes through, you know, the government's action and other private actions and we see the flow of money. I mean, that's, I think, the only black and white you're going to get. So just now I'll get to the end of the, the, the end of that answer is that, so what do you do with the money if you collect it? What is the government going to do with it? I think that the, my guess is that the only thing that they would do is create a constructive trust for the benefit of the citizens of Malaysia and wait for the new election. Now, um, my sense is with a new election, if someone new comes in, uh, then they would probably, uh, you know, the members of parliament have a committee that's investigating, which is uh, filed a report, which is interesting. If you want to follow this, you would, you would read it. Uh, and it's, it's pretty easy to follow. There's a, there's a guy named Tony Pua who, who leads the, the investigation. And of course, he's been chastised. And he might be arrested and he might be shot for all we know because he doesn't say good things about the prime minister. But <coughs> the, uh, they, my, my sense would be that they would authorize someone to go after the money and create an entity that would receive the money for the benefit of either the sovereign fund and the developments that were initially created for the purpose of you know, helping Malaysia citizens. Um, that would be my guess. You know it's not going to happen if this prime minister gets reelected. But I wouldn't think. I mean, I. I think that's, that's um, the, the only other thing I, I guess I should, I probably should add is, um, yeah, yeah. Wait, wait till she gets the mi microphone for you. Behind you. Oh, sorry. Are you saying that this is a crime or a bad thing that doesn't have somebody who can properly pursue a remedy? No, no. no. Well, the remedy can be pursued. I think the question was more like once the money is gathered up, how would it be returned? Because like right now, if you're returning it back to this prime minister, isn't this where the problem began so with this prime minister? who's going to pursue it now? It's being pursued if in... If you're returning it to the prime minister... Well, uh, we don't know where it's going to be returned. No, no, nothing's no, been I collected. Because yeah. you're saying it was stolen from Malaysia. So who in Malaysia right. is chasing this money? Well, Malaysia has created a parliamentary committee that is investigating. Who has, you said? Malaysia. Malaysia, Malaysia okay. The okay. parliament has created a committee. Mm -hmm. And there are several members of parliament that are members of that committee, and they're investigating. They, they have actually created a report on their findings of what happened with the money. So they're investigating. Now, there have been. Uh, several cases brought in different jurisdictions. There's a, a, a case that's been brought in Switzerland against the banks that uh, facilitated the movement of the money. By Malaysia? N no, it's by the Swiss government. Okay. In Switzerland. The, the, the Mala if, is your question, what has Malaysia done about this? And I think your answer is going to be nothing because of the right. prime minister. Right. <laughs> Not that I've read. They haven't. They've attempted to do something, and they the have attorney, a committee. the attorney general of Malaysia, has cleared the prime minister of any wrongdoing. <laughs> so this is a perfect crime. I mean, because in other words, Malaysia is supposed to be the victim, right. and the victim itself seems to be totally That's... unable to do anything, and we. As long as the prime minister and, and, and his political appointees represent the people of Malaysia, yes, correct. Yeah, it's, it's yes. But then again, remember, crime pays. Some of it, anyway. A lot of it. 
Right. Well, what happened, what's happened in Malaysia is are some of the people have been charged under uh, a law that, I, I may be oversimplifying this, but says that if you say anything bad about the government, you can be arrested and prosecuted. So they have actually been prosecuted for saying bad things about what the prime minister did in connection with the sovereign fund, and they've been arrested and prosecuted for that. So, um, so the well, money, so all the money is now sitting outside of Malaysia. Um, well, your guess is as good as mine. It looks like it wound up outside outside of Malaysia. Three point five billion, but then don't forget the raise was <coughs> six to eight ish. Seven, six to eight. Yeah, it was about seven billion. Yeah. Or at least the money that was raised by Goldman Sachs, mm -hmm. close to seven billion dollars of that. We know three and a half billion from the tracing of the funds wound up outside of Malaysia. That's a good question. That's right. They are the investors. Yeah for this theoretically low risk investment and they're supposed to get interest on their 10% interest as a matter of fact uh, and they defaulted on the first payment one MDB defaulted on the first payment which is what that settlement is about that is up here um, so whether or not they actually they, there is a there was a, a comment in the, one of the articles that said that one MDB paid 50 million dollars in interest, but I'm not sure that that actually happened. Go ahead. So just on that point, presumably the state of Malaysia is still obliged to repay these bonds to the ultimate bondholders. Right. I mean, yes. So the, the, these people seem to have extracted $7 billion from within their own country effectively, having raised it outside, but left the obligation with their own state and their people. That's right. And by the way, those companies that they extracted the seven billion dollars from are not all Malaysian companies. So, in other words, again, as I, I said before, I'm pretending I'm Goldman Sachs and I'm doing a deal for the Malaysian government for this sovereign fund and I say, okay, how much interest are you going to pay? We do a short term sheet. It says seven billion on it. 10% interest paid out, you know, two times a year to the bondholders over a period of time. Let's say it's a it's a 10-year term or a 20-year term or whatever the fund is going to be. And um, you know, I did that in 2013. My first payment is due this year a default. It doesn't look like a good thing. But when I'm looking at the investment, it's a sovereign fund. Sovereign funds are not high-risk investments. So, you know, institutions, uh, pension funds are looking for that kind of investment. Yeah, if all things being equal, had they actually used the money to build roads, bridges, and things, they would still have had these payments to make mm -hmm. down the road. Uh, so I, I assume that none of that has changed. So there's still a payment schedule on the on the bonds. I mean, right. and these you know the infrastructure that otherwise would have been built wouldn't have been generating the return. So there's uh, it may actually be <laughs> I was going to say be better off by something like the 400 million that was raised, but obviously not the case. So they, it, it, at the end of the day, they've just left this payment stream with the state of of Malaysia and its people. And you're saying that they've already defaulted on those payments. So it it really is just a one right. big scam. Yeah. So what's a little bit more complicated? Again, we we have it would it would take up a day of of you know dissecting what happened here. The uh, international international petroleum corporation guarantee they what what theoretically happened is that they took three and a half billion dollars, deposited it with the international petroleum corporation, who then in turn guaranteed the payments. So the arbitration in London was about that guarantee and the payments, which theoretically was settled for a payment 
when they would make the payment. It, there's a report that says it was settled. The next day, there was another report that said, well, it's not really settled. So I don't know really, you, you can't get really much information about an arbitration settlement because it's private. So we don't know. Their statements, uh, as a matter of fact, if you give me one second, okay. So um, we were talking about the IPEC, There's a, it's a fund. <clears throat> so I'll just read you a report that I, it was published on uh, the 27th, I think, or the 26th. But anyway, here's what it says. The Abu Dhabi Fund, the International Petroleum Investment Company, said in a stock exchange announcement in London that Malaysia Finance Ministry and 1MDB had agreed to pay $1.2 billion to the Abu Dhabi Fund by the end of the year as part of the agreement overseen by an arbitration panel in London. So that's what they announced to the stock exchange, but you don't know what the details of the agreement were. It's just what they said. What well, say. that turned out to be, well, wait a minute, that's not right. So I don't know where we're going with yeah, this Yeah, and think about it too. I mean, where are they gonna find $1.2 billion in the next seven months? I mean, really. Anyway, okay. <laughs> hey, thanks for coming. <laughs> Thank you very much.